I'm Zachary James and welcome to the Fifth Period Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome back to Fifth Period, the film podcast hosted by two media teachers where when there's something strange in our neighbourhood, what are we going to watch? Ghostbusters! There it is. My name is Mr. Brown and with me as always is... Mr. W- <coughs> Mr. Whittle, I'm sorry guys, I have a bit of dust caught in my throat. The reason being because I had to pull out the old VHS for this one. I sent a video to Mr. Brown on the, the weekend. That's uh, true, I can attest to the fact that he did dust off the old VHS. Literally player. got the box out of the cupboard. It had been in the box for over 15 years, was uncertain whether it would play. It did. And I got about five minutes into watching it via the VHS and go, why am I watching it on this quality? But the nostalgia factor (laughs) was a lot of fun. So, yes, anyone listening to this will most likely already know that I am super, super excited for this podcast. And you're not the only fan this week. I am a huge fan of Ghostbusters myself. Not nearly (laughs) as big a fan as you are, but... Even in Film Club itself, we got huge, huge numbers for this week's selection. So, yeah, I I think it's safe to say this was a crowd favourite. Yes, indeed. In fact, at Film Club, we got everyone to sing along just so that we could show off how big the turnout was. So uh, that sounded a little something like this. There's something weird and it don't look good. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters! Thank you, guys really warmed my heart hearing the crowd and like they they all got into it and like but just the the turnout that we had as well it was packed so i had a blast final film club for the term Mm -hmm. and yeah just really really pleased with how it all went for my favorite film of all time Mm, and you treated us to a little nostalgia as well prior to screening the yes i was stoked about this so part of the vhs experience for me I used to get my parents to take me to the video store on a regular occasion as a a kid, so about six years old, and my mum used to have to, as part of her five weeklies for five dollars, have to um, get the the Ghostbusters every time, to the point where she said, enough's enough, I'm just going to buy you a copy of Ghostbusters from the video store, and that is still the copy I have today from 1988, and that's the one I dusted off and put in the VHS player this weekend. And on that is some trailers that come before it. Like, so I know these trailers note for note because I've watched the movie well over a hundred times and I'm not (laughs) exaggerating with that. I was surprised the video cassette is still working Mm. because um, I have played that thing a lot. So we got to see the the Coca-Cola ad from 1985 with the electric pandas singing Coke is it for all of us. Mm. Which Uh, is pretty interesting because Coke actually owned Columbia at the time that Ghostbusters was Yeah, so there's all the corporate kind of tie-ins and all that stuff. And then there was two trailers as well. Two trailers for films that I've never seen, but I feel like I know the films thoroughly because I know the trailers that well. Silverado. Silverado and Starman. John Carpenter's Starman featuring uh, Jeffrey Lebowski, otherwise known as Jeff Bridges. Mm. Um, Yeah, Mm. we had that little extra treat at Film Club as well. And it was that. It was a real treat. Mm. Uh, On top of our very comprehensive discussion of Ghostbusters today, we will also be doing our student appreciation and regular weekly watches and tantalizing trailers segments. So I will leave time codes in the description below if you want to skip ahead to any of those. Today's student appreciation goes out to Zach, who's in the Javier Oli Film Club Enthusiast Gang. Poor bastard. Yeah, I know, especially if he's um, going along with Oli to any cinema and having to listen to Oli incessantly talk throughout the movie. They went and saw... um, the Ninja Turtles movie on the weekend. Mm, and um, mentioned. I said to Ollie, I said, did you talk through the whole thing? He's like, yeah. As if we're like... Of he course was, I yeah, 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 like it's, he's offended that I even asked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I don't teach Zach, uh, but I've still had the pleasure of having him feature as a voice credit in one of my year 12 films this year. So, ah. Will's animation, um, which is beautifully drawn, but also accompanied by great performances from Zach and Alex. So... Major props to him for that, and a big thank you to him for his intro today. Thanks, Zach. Alrighty, now you and I already mentioned that we want to do a little bit of context, a little bit about the production of Ghostbusters before we jump into the plot breakdown. Absolutely strapping, guys, because we will have a bit of a bumper episode. We do want to really talk about all the things that we find interesting, not only about the film itself, but also everything that happened behind the scenes. Yeah, so I thought a good place to start would be to talk about the writing for it, how Dan Aykroyd, who plays Ray in the film, actually wrote the original script for it, 
a very personal project for him. His family, big ghost enthusiasts, yeah. and, um, like the occult and things like that. His father wrote a book called A History of Ghosts. Mm -hmm. His mother claimed to have seen ghosts multiple times. And his grandfather was a mystic. Yeah. So a lot of history for the Ackroyd family. Uh, Canadian in origin. And then Dan um, came down to New York and actually was part of the Saturday Night Live crew. Mm -hmm. And that's where he met Bill Murray, worked with Jim Belushi, um, and uh, kind of found his chops within the, 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 the co comedy world. But on the side, he's also a prolific writer and very interested in the supernatural. So... Once he started into the late 70s being really kind of confident to start developing projects, he brought in uh, a few of his Canadian mates like Harold Ramis and mm -hmm. um, Ivan Reitman, uh, who they worked on National Lampoon together as well. Yep. So they're all original crew in that National Lampoon era. Uh, and so, yeah, this was a project that I, I was trying to find a date, like whether Dan Aykroyd had said it in an interview as to when he first kind of wrote the initial treatment. I couldn't find any definitive date. There's reference to the early 80s, but then he wrote it with Jim Belushi, his best mate, and... John? John Belushi. John Belushi, sorry. His brother is Jim. John Belushi of Blues Brothers fame. Yeah, so which, almost like a, a brother to him as well. Yes. Because they were just so close. Yeah, and so he wrote it with the intent that um, John Belushi would play the role of Venkman uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the film. But then John Belushi died. And, and the roles have sort of merged. It, like At times, Dan Aykroyd says that the Bill Murray role, the Venkman, was also what he kind of wrote for Eddie Murphy. I think because the script has had so many changes, mm -hmm. the characters have molded and yeah. changed. So there's no distinct character swap overs between them. But yeah, he originally wrote it for himself, John Belushi and Eddie Murphy. I love knowing so much detail around the backstory of the development of this project as a media teacher as well, mm. like just to use it as an example of how stories can take years to develop. And that's just the story component. That's just your premise. And then like production in itself is a whole other story, which we'll get to in time. Yep. For sure. Um, so as you said, brought in Ivan Reitman to direct, but he thought the script was a little too weird and complex. They said it was going to be very pricey the way that Dan Aykroyd initially wanted it to be. Yeah, so apparently they were traveling dimensions yep. and they, a lot of it was set out in space. Yep. And so Ivan Reitman told him to pair it right back. And he actually suggested bringing on Harold Ramis as their third writer. Mm. And they all ended up out at uh, Dan Aykroyd's cabin out in like the middle of the woods writing together. Yep. And apparently uh, Harold Ramis' daughter says they were just stoned half the time when they were out there. I mean, it's the 70s, 80s. Like, yeah, that's the creative flow. It's a great little story about how collaborating can like really refine a product. So... Dan Aykroyd was very conducive to like having these inputs from Harold Ramis and Ivan Reitman. The product that we got obviously kind of tells the tale because it's got a bit more down to earth element to it. Mm. Uh, and I, that's really what Reitman wanted to have happen. Like he decided to have it set in the city. Yep. New York City in itself is kind of a character, character in the yeah. film. So that was really something that worked out well. And then playing around with the characters and all that stuff. That mm. Yeah, it, it took a few years to flesh that out. Well, and it's cool how receptive Dan Aykroyd was to that feedback. I mean, obviously it was a very personal project for him. So to have two outsiders come in mm. and completely change it around. Like there's still some things that were from his original script, but the core idea was virtually stripped right back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, he always seems to talk about it really affectionately. And he liked all of the input that he got from others. Mm. But yeah, they had heaps and heaps of issues early on in development. There was a very, very short turnaround to write it. And they even started shooting with an incomplete script and were making changes the whole time that they were in production. But the other big thing was that because, as I mentioned, Columbia had been bought out by Coke, they weren't really that savvy in terms of the filmmaking business. So they butted heads a lot with Frank Price, who was yeah. the... CEO of Columbia and in the end even though he was really passionate about the project they ended up parting ways and he left Columbia during the the making of the film he said he was very sad that he had to step away from it when adjusted for inflation this is Columbia's biggest grossing picture of all time we're talking 35 years later ish I think that's impressive in its own right but um greenlit for 30 million dollars mm -hmm. in May 1983 on the caveat that they have it ready to um, be screened in June 1984. Unbelievable. In just over a year. Now, 
Sounds like a lot of time for you media students that think <laughs> you get five weeks to make a film. To make that feature length film with ambitious special effects. That was the big one, the yeah. The clincher is the special effects. Yeah, yeah. I got, I've got quite a few notes on the, the special effects and how much that was holding them up yep. later on. Mm -hmm. The other major thing that I wanted to talk about before we jump into plot details was the name, Ghostbusters. Yes, yes, yep. Early on, they really wanted to call it Ghostbusters, but couldn't get the rights to the name because it was owned by Filmation, which yeah. was an animation company. There was some cartoon that was called Ghostbusters. And so they had to shoot under the guise that they would film everything as Ghostbusters, but then they would also film everything as Ghost Breakers in the event that they didn't get the rights to it. Yep, there's like there's documents going around where they, the names are getting changed up in the air. Some documents have Ghost Stoppers written on mm -hmm. there. There's even some takes, some like initial takes where they were doing some kind of pre-production test footage. You know, the ad that's on Dana's TV yep. a bit later, they were doing a bit of test shooting of that. They say Ghost Breakers. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, and yeah. apparently it was when they were shooting the scene, it must be the scene from right at the end when they arrive at the hotel and everyone's cheering Ghostbusters. Yep. They just called Columbia, held up the phone and said, listen to this, yeah. we're not making them do it again. That's and right. They just, yeah. And they just... Of course, because they were already on such a time crunch. You couldn't afford to be shooting everything twice and changing out posters and things in the background and all of the dialogue. Like, it would have been a nightmare to keep that Absolutely. up. Absolutely. And I'm glad they did because, like, I don't think Ghost Stoppers or Ghost Breakers has the same ring as Ghostbusters. Um, I so agree. They, they, they paid out Filmation and, and got the, the licensing for it. Funny thing, though, is that post this movie... Mm. Two Ghostbusters cartoons hit the market. Mm. One was from Filmation, essentially the continuation of what their original licensing had from the 70s. But it had none of the characters that we know from the movie in the, the show. And one of the Ghostbusters was like a gorilla. Oh, yeah. But then Columbia released a cartoon show called The Real Ghostbusters. Yes. So there's a real Ghostbusters cartoon that I used to watch religiously as well it that's was, with a blonde egon as that's well, right yeah. yeah so they did kind of vary up the look of some of the characters but essentially it was still the four of them janine was there slimer was their buddy instead oh, okay. of like an enemy i still think the most interesting thing about them getting the rights to the name though you know i mentioned frank price was the ceo of columbia mm -hmm. but then he butted heads with coke and ended up leaving he then became the ceo of universal and they were the ones that had the rights to it so oh. the animation was sort of like a sub company yep. of Universal. And so because he'd been championing the project the entire time, he was like, yeah, of course we'll give you the rights to it. So nice. that's, it's a really cool little detail. Last thing in terms of pre-production and interesting kind of information was casting. Mm. So John Belushi didn't get the role because he was dead. Mm -hmm. um, Eddie Murphy declined the role in the end and then they kind of rewrote things. he was things. doing Beverly Hills Cop Correct, maybe? Correct, which... Beverly Hills Cop became the highest grossing film of 1984. This was the second highest. So go. it sounds like he made a good decision yeah. in terms of <laughs> focusing on that one. So they brought in Bill Murray and then Harold Ramis, but they did offer to Michael Keaton to play the role of Venkman. Is that right? And he turned that down. So that was quite an interesting one. And the other one that stood out for me, John Candy as, uh, um, as Lewis. As Lewis Tully. Yeah. And he basically agented himself out of the movie because he got his agent to ask for too much money. I had heard that he had all these ideas for the character. That and there's that as well. With. Like he was meant to be German and have all these dogs. Yeah. And yeah, Ivan Reitman's like, we've already got dogs in the main stuff. You can't have other dogs. Like, yeah, so basically that didn't rub the right way. And then John Candy talked himself out of the film. But I think the result of Rick Moranis as Lewis. He's, he's best on ground for me. Impeccable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so good. So this movie came out on June 7th, 1984. Mm, mm. Summer Blockbuster. You know what was released the week after to, you know, then uh, their, their competition for the Summer Blockbuster? Mm -hmm. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Oh, well, you would argue no competition at all. Well, I not only I would argue that, this was the first year for five years where the biggest selling like film of, of the year wasn't a Lucasfilm or a Spielberg film. Yeah, right. Um, so for five years straight, those two had the monopoly on just like having the biggest films of the year. But this one technically went to Beverly Hills Cop on uh, highest grossing. But when Ghostbusters is considered in terms of... Because the, they, they did this re-release a year later um, and they made more money on it. So that's why it's Columbia's biggest grossing picture of all time when right. you look at over time. But for 1984... Um, 
yeah, Indiana Jones was pipped at the post by GB as well as Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, and look, to be fair, out of the original trilogy, Temple of Doom is the lesser film. Holy smoke! Class landing! Yeah, uh, yeah. well, that uh, I'm going to take your word for that. Yeah. <laughs> I have seen it, but not for a long time. Um, anyway, so there's, there's our Harry F reference. Are you trying to develop a sense of humour or am I going deaf? Ah, of course, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think we were going to squeeze him in this yeah, chat. When the film starts, I love the opening music. It's really, really <laughs> eerie. And one thing that I think works really well, they take out a lot of the natural sound from the scene so that the music is more prominent and it gives the librarian wandering through the stacks a much creepier vibe. The way sequentially the music plays over the top, we hear the first note when the Columbia Pictures sign comes up and mm -hmm. the star shines on the top of the, the statue's um, uh, torch. And that's the first note we hear. And then the music, like you said, just carries through the scene. The reliance on Elmer Bernstein's beautiful score. Mm. So I just adore the film score in this film. Like it just rolls with the whole thing and just works so well. Take note, John Williams, of how to do it effectively. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I totally agree that when we get into the depths of the library yeah. um, and what the music is doing, but also the, the complimentary sound effects for like, whenever there is that creepy, like eerie movement of the books. We get that beautiful stone lion's head outside the- The, the foreshadowing of it? Well, yes, but also just that everything, you, you mentioned how New York was almost a character in itself. Mm -hmm. All the external shots, New York, but all of the interior shots were shot in LA. LA that's right, yep. Yeah, so including the, the basement of the library. I really like the practical effects in this sequence. So the books going from shelf to shelf was just wire work. Yep. The cards coming out of the drawer was someone with a straw. That's right. So they had someone behind pushing the drawers and then had someone else with the straw blowing the cards it's up. It's just it's uh, so like, simple. It's so cool. Really yeah. effective. Yep. I also like that they conceal what the ghost looks like in this opening. So we get this beautiful tracking shot of the librarian running through the stacks and it's twisting and turning. You can't see an exit. So you kind of panic with her yep. and you're getting the fear on her face. And then as she turns that final corner and the music kicks in and she's screaming, you don't know what she's screaming at, but it's terrifying because you can see the fear in her eyes. And then later, like when the Ghostbusters are interviewing her, it had arms because it reached out to grab me. Even then we are still yet to see the ghost or mm. a ghost of any kind. So yeah, that, that anticipation build is really strong. It's really, really well done. Yeah. Enter Peter Venkman, played by Bill Murray. So he works at a university. He's doing tests for ESP, or it's under the guise of tests for ESP, but really he's just flirting with the students at the university. Incredible. That's five for five. You can't see these, can no, you? No, no. You're not cheating me, are you? No, I swear, they're just coming to me. I mentioned to you when we were watching it, the male student that he's getting everything wrong, he's kind of like a, a knockoff of Rick Moranis. Yeah, he really is. Um, I saw an interview with him as part of my research for this and like, he accidentally spits his chewy out on one of the, the takes that they were doing. And supposedly the, the, the crew behind the camera laughed hysterically that it got written in. Now that's demonstrative of what happens in this entire film yeah. where they have said that pretty much every scene in the entire film has some form of ad lib going on. And some of the most memorable lines are ad libbed yeah, as well. Just love it. So like even the guy who's um, failing the ESP there, yeah, I love He's it. not even yeah, failing. I'll yes, tell you what the effect is, it's pissing me off. <laughs> <laughs> and he storms out and Bill Murray says the great line. He goes, that's the kind of resentment your ability is going to provoke. <laughs> Worth noting that with Bill Murray too, they didn't even know if he was going to turn up. Like Dan Aykroyd was the only one that had been in contact with him. Yep. And then they were like, are we going to get him? I think he had already established a bit of a reputation as being a bit unreliable so at this point. So supposedly he was known for non-formalized 
commitments to mm. films and stuff like that and like kept everyone kind of on edge there's an interview with annie potts who played janine mm-hmm. um, where she spoke about how bill just rocked up and clearly didn't know what was going on in this scene hadn't done his script work but still just goes i'm bill murray and i'm gonna do it and he did does he it. does yeah, do yeah, it yeah, yeah, that's yeah. very true yeah So a very excited Ray comes in and the two of them meet up with Egon at the library to investigate paranormal activity. I love, like, oh, oh, I... (laughs) He's peeking out here, guys. Oh, but, like, the the interaction of Venkman first and, Mm -hmm. like, you know, Venkman is the mouth of the three, right? Yep. Ray's the heart yep. and then Egon's the head and we get to incrementally meet them, right? So when we first meet Egon... He has like the the it's doctor's like stethoscope, stethoscope yeah. to the table in like the main area. <laughs> Just the way he's presented as the ultimate geek. This reminds me of the time I tried. To, you tried to drill a hole in your head. Remember that? It's so good. Supposedly his re- retort in that um, was ad lib, which is. That would have worked if you hadn't tried to stop, if you hadn't stopped. I love it because it's just like (laughs) trepanation. Is that, that's what you're doing? So good. But the dynamic between the three of them, just palpable. And like you said, those distinct personalities, I think that's one of the major flaws of sequel films, of remakes of the Ghostbusters franchise. The, uh, is it the 2016 one? Yep. The, the, the female Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So they don't have distinct personalities. Like it starts off and they sort of do, but then they all become the jokey ones. Yes. Um, Whereas in this one, as you said, it's quite clearly, you've got the one that's really giddy and excited about it all. The one who's all logic. And then Bill Murray, just the charming, charismatic, sleazy one. Brilliant. (laughs) I know he has a fandom generally and all that stuff. And like, I'm part of that for sure. Like, I just think when he's on screen, he is just magnetic. Yeah. He really is, and they do a great job early on of establishing him as the more sceptical one of the three of them. Obviously, even the tests that he was running at the university, he didn't really believe in. He was just utilising them yeah, for but his what, own. Like, sorry to interrupt, but like he is sceptical in one sense, but opportunistic in the other. Mm. He's the one who wants to, to go into business for ourselves. Yeah, even things like when they're talking about the books, and he's like, no one would stack books this way. Someone blows your, their nose and you want to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before you really get to know the characters, they do a really good job of just establishing who they are. So even when they go down into this basement, he keeps saying like sarcastic responses. Ray keeps just getting crazy excited about everything he's like he a sees. giddy kid in a candy store isn't he yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. and then egon like even at one point bill murray's like what should we do and egon just kind of looks down at his device again and just <laughs> and starts typing it away. Out of his hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um but then of course ray has a brilliant plan get her that was your whole plan get her <laughs> i love bill afterwards like hanging shit on him like that was your whole plan get it but they just you really believe that they're old friends <laughs> yeah, when he's doing yeah, that yeah, like yeah, yeah. It, it's a very infectious kind of relationship that they have but how good does that ghost look that first ghost that we see mm-hmm. 1984 people go and watch this film if you haven't already and we'll look at that first ghost in the library just phenomenal special effects yeah and look the special effects team fully admitted that they had such restricting time constraints and that there are some really janky effects in the film they fully admit that but this is certainly not one of them this looks fantastic yeah they really went all out on that first ghost and so they lose their university grant so they decide to go into business for themselves and become ghost hunters and this is the thing that you were saying he sort of gives this uh, this stirring speech and it's almost like a sing-songy kind of call it fate yeah call it karma call it luck (laughs) But of course, to finance the business, they have to sell the house that Ray's parents have left him. You're never going to regret this, Ray. Uh, just uh, <laughs> My parents bought me that house. I was born there. And you then didn't Egon, even negotiate. Egon's like working out the interest rates on the side and <laughs> Peter's like telling him to shut up. And, oh, so good. The franchise rights alone will make us rich beyond our wildest dreams. I love it so much, but then they get to the purchasing. It's such a cool set piece, the yes. fire station. Oh. Oh, so people go there. Like if I had, if I ever went to America and I went to New York, Mm -hmm. I'd have to go to the firehouse. Like even though it's unrecognizable as what it was in 84. It's still used as a firehouse. Yeah, right. Okay. I'd certainly go there and get my photo taken. Well, another one that 
the internal and external shots. One was New York, one was LA. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's just very, very cool. Um, but I love the contrast between Egon talking about like all the safety issues. Like I, I don't know whether he's like bargaining with the price or whether he's just saying it's no good. But then Ray sliding down the the fire pole. Does and... his pole still work? But I like I still say to this day because like I think Egon's last line about how poor the property is is like and the neighborhood is a demilitarized zone. I when my house is a mess, I call it a demilitarized zone. Um, but yeah, Ray. Basically, the whole kind of sales pitch, they're trying to work with the real estate agent to get the price lowered. It just seems a little pricey for a unique fixer-upper opportunity, that's all. What do you think, Egon? I think this building should be condemned. And then Ray the Kid He's just so comes excited. and spoils the I'm going to get my stuff. Kid. Let's stay here tonight. <laughs> and then you know, Bill Murray out. just turns back. Yeah. I think we'll take it. Yeah. Interesting with that firehouse is that when Harold Ramis died in 2014, mm -hmm. um, they held like a vigil there for him and people oh, cool. made a big pile of Nestle Crunch Bar wrappers. <laughs> You've earned it. Twinkie wrappers and spores, molds and fungus. Like they, they, they had like this whole like kind of homage to Harold Ramis and his character of um, Egon. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Very, very sweet. Then we are introduced to Sigourney Weaver's character, Dana, and her neighbor, Louis Tully, played by Rick Moranis. <laughs> oh, Dana, it's you. Oh, hi, yes, Louis, it's me. I thought it was a drugstore. Oh, are you sick? Oh, no, no, I'm fine. I feel great. Just ordered some more vitamins and stuff. <laughs> Just, he's so good. Like, this introduction to him is a perfect way to give us an indication of how Sigourney Weaver's character is. She's patient with him, but also she's a little bit sick of this. She has to deal with Lewis every day coming up and trying to chat to her. It's a good way of introducing us to both of their characters simultaneously because of the way that they play off each other. Yeah, what I love about this film is the unconventional narrative structure of it. Like Dan Aykroyd's original kind of treatment had the story starting straight into the, the businesses established Instead, what Harold Ramis brought in to the, the storyline was the establishment aspect of like setting up the business. Mm. The normal world getting kind of uprooted and, and changed is more for Dana than for the Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. Without Dana's problem, which happens quickly after this scene we're just talking about, the Ghostbusters story would just be kind of like cleaning up the town and that's that. Yeah. But like the complications come from what Dana and her character's issues bring to the Ghostbusters. So like, I like that in terms of the protagonists themselves are faced with the challenge, but it's not that's not the only challenge. Not Dana and then the EPA. Mm. So it's a combining thing that kind of builds the climax. The momentum that comes in within the film because they've structured it that way, it's really a point of difference, I think. Well, yeah, and it, I guess it all comes back to that idea of making it a more grounded story. Yep. We as an audience, if we'd gone into it and this was already established, we go, all right, this isn't the world we live in. No. Whereas if ghosts don't exist and this is sort of the first official sighting of a ghost, then everyone in that world still has that skepticism that we would have if we'd heard a story like this. So we get to actually go on the journey with them, which I think is a really good way to bring us into the narrative. It, it does add a realism to it all for sure. Great line from Lewis talking about his 20-minute uh, workout that he puts on high speed, so it's only a 10-minute workout. I got a great workout. Good. You want to come in for a mineral water? Oh, I'd really like to, um, Lewis, but I have to go to rehearsal now. Excuse me. No sweat. I'll take a rain check on that. I always have plenty of low-sodium mineral water and other nutritious foods in the house, but you already know that. Yeah, I know that. Rick Moranis is a comedic genius, um, really underrated. Well, they basically said he made Lewis. Yeah. Like, it, it was just a name yep. before he started yeah. playing it. Yep. He, he came the character. He brought in the geekiness of it all. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah, very, very cool. Yep. Um, and he talks about how, like, you can see that he's a bit smitten with Sigourney Weaver's character, with Dana, because he talks about how her TV was on. And so he turned up his TV so that people would just think there was some kind of technical glitch in the building. But prior to that, he went out on the balcony and tries to pull the TV out. Yeah. Like, how could you possibly even do that? That's wild. Like, they're on the 22nd floor. It's a good way to, again, establish who he is and he's a bit of a, a loser. But also, it's the first kind of 
indication that she is being haunted. Her TV turned itself on. Correct. She mentions that, oh, I'm sure I turned that yeah, off. Yeah, she didn't realize she left it on. Like, so, you know, she may not have even turned on her TV in the morning. So, yeah, she, you could see, like, a sincerity of, like, confusion at the, the issue. Yeah. I mean, she does, as you said, get haunted virtually straight after this. And I really like the way that she gets haunted the first time. Like, it starts off and it's pretty subtle. Mm -hmm. Her groceries start opening themselves and the eggs start cooking on the counter, which is just a such a cool effect. Very cool. How did they do that? Do you know? You've got more of an insight into some of the behind the scenes. I don't stuff. know that particular one. They they didn't talk about it. Like, so there's a great documentary out um, called Cleaning Up the Town, which really deep dives into scene by scene almost the technical aspects of like how they constructed things. Maybe I missed what they said for that one, but I, I'm not too sure whether they actually heated the counter. My assumption is that that's the only way they could do it, right? Like, yeah, I don't they know probably, if maybe they had like an overhead. Yeah, heating. yeah, they would have certainly pre-cooked them so that like the the response was like ready to go. But yeah, yeah I'm not too sure in particular how those eggs started but, cooking on the but counter. But it's cool. It's a very cool effect. Yeah. Um, and again, just simple stuff. Yep. Uh, well, actually, I don't know how simple it was, but it looks simple, but it's very effective. And then she opens the fridge and you've got the whole demon dogs and the gateway for Goza. It's, it's all cool. Yeah. It's very, very cool. But also we get a bit of foreshadowing in this sequence because on the counter next to the carton of eggs is the Stay Puffed Marshmallows. For sure. Um, so the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man was a character that was invented for the film, but he was sort of based on the a bit of a cross between the Pillsbury Doughboy, the Michelin Man, and the Angelus Marshmallow Man. This is one of the remaining things from Aykroyd's early treatments, um, mm. that the Marshmallow Man was one character he had in mind from uh, when he first wrote it. I tried to think of the most harmless thing. Something I loved from my childhood. Something that could never ever possibly destroy us. Mr. Stay Puffed. Reitman actually used it as a leverage tool, maybe Ramus did, um, to say, well, you've got this comedic element in it. If we make, because the film was quite serious in, in uh, Aykroyd's first uh, initial treatments. They said, well, if you want to lean into the more the comedy aspect of it, such as what you've got with the Marshmallow Man, we need more comedy prior as well to kind of, that's what we're going to frame the film as. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. We then meet Annie Potts' character, Janine. Janine Melwitz. Janine Melwitz. Yeah. Um, she's great. She's oh. really good. I like her dynamic between, like, it's different for different characters. So she's, like, a bit flirtatious with Egon, but she's just, like, sassy with, uh, with Venkman. So she really leans into that, New York sat like you know harsh kind of sassiness but in fact Annie Potts is from the deep south like so um, ah. she really plays the role well um Janine with her bug eyes Janine sorry about the bug eyes thing I'll be in my office he's <laughs> such a jerk but like you know so she doesn't take any crap from Peter yeah but then Egon just emerges from under, under the desk, desk. <laughs> so, so weird. funny and that that conversation between the two I've been reading this great book and he just goes, print is dead. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's just like, no one's going to print anything anymore in 84. Yeah. Um, the relationship, the flirtatiousness, they actually cut out a lot of scenes from the film. They actually had a much more established romance in, in like the, um, the original cut. I like how, as you said, she doesn't take any crap. Like even later on when um, Peter refuses to get her any help, like they become a booming business and then she answers the phone. Ghostbusters, what do you want? <laughs> Dana comes to hire them um, and Venkman jumps the gate to yeah, greet her. Yeah, yeah. Probably an improv. <laughs> Just yeah, like half yeah, of yeah. his stuff. Yep. But yeah, the others say that they'll do research for it and then he's like, I'll escort her back to her apartment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I Like that, that whole, again, it's very similar to the library scene where the three of them are kind of bouncing off each other. Dana in the room with them is kind of playing the straight person, mm -hmm. whereas the other three are kind of showing their characteristics. And yeah, Dana just wants to solve the problem, whereas they're all kind of got their different motives that yep. are showing. Yeah, very cool. Um, and then he escorts her back to the apartment and he plays the keys on the piano. Oh, they hate this. <laughs> That's right, guys. It's Dr. Venkman. <laughs> <laughs> He's like talking to the ghost <laughs> and she, she says something like, um, you don't really come across as a scientist to I me. Mean, you're more like a game show host. Yeah. <laughs> he definitely is. And she, he goes into the bedroom 
And she goes, nothing ever happened in there. And he's like, what a crime. <laughs> but her like rolling her eyes at him. Yeah. That scene is one of my favorites probably in terms of just the dialogue is really strong. Establishing Dana as someone who is not going to tolerate shit, but mm -hmm. she's still kind of She's still playful about yeah, it. She's yeah. connecting with Peter in a weird way. And the, the, the scenes between those two that come later, it kind of allows for like a, a realism in terms of the relationship they eventually have. Yeah. 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 Um, but he can't wait that long. He confesses his love to her right then and there. No kiss. <laughs> and then I love that he narrates his own yeah. departure. He's like, and then she threw me out. <laughs> and they even throw in another, and um, we didn't even mention it for the first scene with Lewis in it, but there's a, a two second shot where, Venkman gets thrown out in the hallway and we see Lewis has been locked out of his apartment <laughs> again. again. Yeah, 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 So yeah. good. Yeah. I, they do it at least three times in the film. Yep. But something I was only thinking about last night, it's hilarious that he constantly gets locked out of his apartment and then later on he gets inhabited by the key master. Yes. Yeah, that's very cool. I never thought of that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> With their funds exhausted and no real leads on Dana's case, they're, they're feeling very down in the dumps. They're having their... Uh, their final Chinese meal. This magnificent feast represents the last of the petty cash money. Yeah. <laughs> but then they get a phone call and we got one. The energy that comes from this scene, like um, the music really supports it. Janine rings the bell. Who says it? Ray goes, the call. And then they're, 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 they're off to the cupboard. Slide down, down the pole. Slide down the pole, getting the Ecto-1. You got the sped up Ecto-1 yeah, pulling yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get that siren that we <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, so good. But I love that when Janine talks to him on the phone, oh, they'll be totally discreet. <laughs> and then, hey, anyone seen a ghost? That is awesome irony. I love it so much. <laughs> There's some quality lines. I like the guy that's standing outside the um, the elevator. And oh. they're like, oh, we're exterminators. And he goes, that's got to be some cockroach. Oh, bite, bite your, your head, head off, off, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the next one. <laughs> he just waits. Yeah. But there's also some really good physical comedy as well. Um, when they turn on Ray's uh, pack, the and sound, then they, and then they just step away from it. But like the, they, the the doco I watched on the, the movie, like really talked about how they really were conscious with what sound they wanted to happen once they activated the proton packs. Where they did, they wanted it to sound like it was warming up, that it was dangerous, mm. that it was heavy duty. And they, I th they really smash it. There's like a bassy rumble when they, they switch that thing on. It's a great it's, sound it, effect. Yeah. And then we're introduced to probably the most iconic ghost in the franchise, Slimer. Yes. I love this detail. Uh, based on John Belushi, but not really. Yeah, kind of, but not really, but kind of. Well, they said the guy that designed him, they said as a way to still uh, pay homage to John Belushi, they wanted him to design Slimer to look like him. And he didn't have the time to do it. And he was also really struggling with the concept of making a character like this look like a human. Mm. So he didn't do it. And he told them he did. And then he was like, what do you think? And they were like, it's great. It looks just like him. The way he, um, Slimer, <laughs> eats the, um, the food, though. Like, so it's also in the motion. It's very much reminiscent of um, Belushi's character in Animal, Animal House. House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I just love, like, I love him being like, so I didn't and told them I did. And they were like, it looks great. <laughs> that line, he slimed me. That was an improv. He said like four or five different things every take. And they, they ended up calling him Slimer based on that, that, that line. Because originally that, that ghost was meant to be called Onion Head or something like that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And then it ended up becoming Slimer. There you Not go. that they actually ever call him Slimer in the film. But um, maybe in like a sequel. Well, in the in the real Ghostbusters cartoon, when oh, it becomes their part friend, of their, he's yeah. Slimer then for sure. Um, so they chase him down into the ballroom, and I'm totally on board with Venkman pulling the tablecloth off the table. The flowers I would do are still that. standing. Yeah. Oh, oh, that that is when <laughs> Venkman goes to the next tier of lovability for me when he's in that room because the balance of the the tension and the excitement, but they're still delivering some. Very, very 
funny lines in that sequence in the ballroom. Mm. Like um, when Ray throws the trap out and he's like, all right, I'm going to open the trap. Don't look at the trap. And then I Egon, looked at the trap, Ray. Oh, when Egon's worry of looking at the <laughs> trap, Venkman, shorten your fuse. I don't want to get my face burnt off. And then like Venkman's like looking at his stream. Like, I've <laughs> never I used this? the equipment yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, such a mess. This is when uh, they talk about don't cross the streams. Yeah. Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. All right, that's bad. Okay. All right, important safety tip. Thanks, Egon. Foreshadowing, obviously, for the big climax of the film for later sure. on as yep. well. Yep. Um, another improvised line. We came, we saw, we kicked its ass. Did you see it? What was it? Oh, I love it so much. <laughs> but then we get the second time that the Ghostbusters theme plays. We get more of it this time um, for the montage of their rising success. You so the, the newspaper titles that are mm. popping up while they, they've got a scene on the, the, the split screen. It's, it it's works really effectively to just quickly depict that they're being successful, right? Yeah. 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 Um, Ray Parker Jr. was saying he struggled so much with the song. Mm. He, w he was looking at the advertisement that they made and it reminded him of like old school extermination ads. Yep. And he used to always remember that they would say, who are you going to call in that? And then it just, everything clicked into place for him. Because like he, he makes a valid point in this um, recent interview where he goes, it's all well and good now because we all know the song. But take a step back for a minute. Get told you guys to make a theme song for a movie called Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters yeah. you know, how, what, how do you put that in as a, like a lyrical melody? Did you know there was a lawsuit against the theme? Huey Lewis filed it because he said it sounded too much like his song, I Want a New Drug. I want a new drug. Want the home in the sick. Something strange in your neighborhood. Who you gonna call? Okay. I don't think I was aware of that one. Yeah. But I, I like in this montage that it shows Dana's reaction to it as well because it shows that she's sort of coming around to what they're doing and she has an interest in it and she's fascinated. She like giggles at it. So like you can see that there is an attraction there as yep, well. Yep. Um, and yeah, the the radio says like they, they busted a ghost at like a dance club and then they stayed on to dance the night away with some lucky ladies. <laughs> That's Casey Kasem. They're like the really well-known radio DJ. So ah. they, they got some big names throughout it, but like obviously most of the money goes to the special effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, are we going to talk about Ray's dream? Yeah, we. <laughs> so uh, an interesting fact that I wasn't aware of on top of what it already infers was that the ghost within the dream mm -hmm. is actually an ex-Playboy playmate. Uh, oh, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to clarify, the ghost sexually gratifies Ray in a dream. It's in implied. They, they obviously cut it so that like the film could still get its PG rating. Yeah, I did hear that originally it wasn't supposed to be a dream, though. It was actually supposed to be a scene that occurred. Well, the film was meant to be a, a, like for an adult audience. So they actually kind of changed things and changed things again in terms of editing so that um, it could get that PG rating. For instance, going back to the very first scene, when we first meet Venkman and it says um, Venkman burn in hell written mm -hmm. on like it's graffitied on his front door. Supposedly there was some much more vulgar things written on that right. door. But um, because they wanted to make it a bit more family friendly, they changed up a few things, including only implying that Ray in his dream gets um, some fun from a floating Playboy mm. playmate. <laughs> Thank goodness too, so that it could become uh, a young Mr. Whittle's favorite film. Correct. Um, but then we get uh, the introduction of Winston, who was originally supposed to have a much bigger role, but quite a lot of what his character was written as originally went to Bill Murray. Yeah, so Ernie Hudson got brought in a bit later on. And yeah, right up until the, the first day of, um, of shooting, he was of the mind that his role was quite big. And so for the first week of shooting, there was a bit of kind of tension in the air because mm. his role got scaled right back. And Harold Ramis has said in interviews, we just can't give that much of the, the best comedic lines to this guy who comes in a bit later. So, yeah, they, they ended up giving him to Bill Murray's character, Peter. Yeah, which obviously works better for the film. And despite the fact that Ernie Hudson was, like, a little pissed off about it at the time, 
he looks back on it and like maybe this is just him putting on a brave face but he looks back and he goes that's hollywood it happens for like, sure he seems pretty cool about it i think now. the pros outweigh the cons in terms of what ernie hudson got for out of the film for oh sure. definitely yeah. definitely yeah. Yep. but like what we said about the others he's distinct he has his own personality and they really wanted his character involved in the film because they wanted to have an outsider someone who wasn't involved in uh, this kind of line of work beforehand, but he just needed a job. And so it, it's kind of our way of joining in and embracing the film through his eyes. Such a great story device mm. to have a character come in to remind us of like the... Skepticism. Yeah, and, and the absurdity of the situation in a sense. Um, and to, yeah, to kind of further ground the film for sure. Which... I actually don't think works as well if he had been introduced earlier on in the Agreed, film. Agreed, for sure, because he would then be with them. So, like, there's these varying points of questioning the supernatural element of the film. Obviously, at the, the start with the university lecturer mm -hmm. and all of that, then Dana comes in, then Winston comes in, and then later Peck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, there's this constant questioning which allows the film to kind of be a bit more believable yes yeah. for sure uh Vengman goes and visits dana during her uh recital rehearsal and he says you were the best in your row <laughs> so good <laughs> this uh i love that it's kind of like a ballet performance this whole scene where they're in front of the fountain what's with the stiff yeah uh, the, the stiff. Uh, and he said i don't have to take this kind of abuse from you i got lots of people who want to abuse me <laughs> So many great lines that I've just, yeah, you can imagine half of them were improvised by Murray. Yes. Yeah. He gives her a bit of an update on the case and then uh, asks her on a date or under the guise that they'll discuss her case further. Yep. But this is when Venkman is introduced to Walter Peck, played by one William Atherton. Typecast as a jerk. He was also the jerk in Die Hard as well. Yes. Uh, we've got another Die Hard reference coming up as well. I don't know if you picked up Ooh, on one. Maybe, maybe there's, I there's haven't. There's a deep cut Die Hard connection to this film. You're very perceptive. There you go. Um, but yes, uh, Atherton certainly plays the jerk in Die Hard and does well in this one as well. Yeah, so it's hilarious that the bad guy in the film is the environmentalist. I love that. Like, you know, it speaks very much to 80s Reaganism as mm. well. Like, you know, to go, the success of a business is much more important than the environment. Yeah. <laughs> but, but because he is effectively right about everything, they really have to hammer home how much a jerk he is. Yeah. So that you're still on the side of everyone else. I reckon even the naming, Walter Peck. Like, yeah. It's such well, because a... later he refers to him as Pecker. And it's yeah. like, it's Peck. Yeah. But that whole saying the magic word, that first interaction. Oh, with I love it. Like, What's I the magic word? <laughs> Please. <laughs> like, I'm a stickler for manners and like, just like that kind of manners. Like just saying, please and thank you. And so that one has really stuck with me over the years. When someone like can't remember to say please, in my mind, you're as bad as Walter Peck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, so Bill Murray refuses to give Peck a, a tour or refuses to show him the machinery. But I like that straight after that, we have the Twinkie analogy scene so that we can hear just how dangerous the machinery is. Yeah. It would be a Twinkie 35 feet long, weighing approximately 600 pounds. That's a big Twinkie. What do you think of the effects that like the matte painting sort of effects where they have like a cityscape, but then they, they put the building into it? Works a treat for me. I really like it. Like yeah. it's a bit fantastical, but it works for the style of film. So, so Dana's, Dana's building especially is very important for that. We see the establishing shot um, when we first meet Dana of that building where they're put on top of the, the building that they chose, mm -hmm. um, additional architecture yeah. to allow for what happens later in the film. But that was all based on um, Ramus uh, remembers from his time in another state, I can't remember where, looking at particular uh, architecture and then just liking like things that are unique on the top of a building. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, the, the map painting works a treat uh, for me. Yeah, yeah, and the actual rooftop, it was a set again in like a, a sound studio in LA, but I love that practical set. That's the, very cool. The particular sound stage that they used was raised an extra 30 feet high, not for their film, mm -hmm. but for an old film um, from like the fifties. And they've got f footage, like they, they didn't believe it at first. They're like, you know, this is the biggest soundstage Columbia has, but supposedly it's 30 foot high. How can that possibly be? But there's actual footage of 
the sound, like the whole building being raised so that it can do this additional set from the 50s. And it's just mind blowing watching the, the kind of cool. engineering about it all. But then they show the, the set that eventually becomes um, Goza's kind of pyramid y kind of, what would you call that? The, 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 uh, the, the door. gateway? The gate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and how, like, that's just like an epic scale to it to the point where Spielberg came and checked out the set. Like Spielberg <laughs> was really not known for going out and because he's so busy doing his own things. Yeah. But he had heard that the set was so impressive that Spielberg came out and had a look at it. It is impressive. Right, it's so. very cool. Yeah, sure. um, so we see the demon dogs break out of their sort of gargoyle statue um, things. Oh, the, the glowing red eye. Yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. I can't believe that Dana made a date on the night that Lewis was throwing his party. <laughs> but he doesn't That's mind. That's okay, you, you can, can bring, bring him. him. <laughs> uh, yes. uh, and then he gets locked out for the third time from his own party. Yep. The Dana attack here, that is cool. That is a very, very, very cool hell. attack. Supposedly the guys who kind of uh, operated the, the arms, the, yeah. they were really reluctant to like grab her with like anger and aggressive, like in an aggressive way. And she had to like just grab one of them and go, get over it and put like <laughs> put the hand to her breast and stuff like that. Like just grab it with sincerity. Yeah. Um, and so after that, she kind of broke the ice on set. The, these are monsters breaking out of the armchair and really grabbing her. And like, yeah, that, that, oh, I remember as a kid, that was probably the scariest scene in the whole film, I reckon. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And the whole idea of her being possessed by a doll, that was her idea. Like she on set just started bending over and acting like the dog statue. And that's what gave Ivan Reitman the idea that she would be possessed by it. Just so cool. And again, it just shows how much of the film wasn't really established while they were already shooting it. Yeah, yep. This attack is very cool. Not just the couch or the armchair with the claws coming out of it, but the dog in the kitchen leaning against the door oh, and the I imprint of the face. Because like it looks like a regular door. Like yeah. obviously it's just like some kind of sheet where they yeah. have the claws kind of um, protrude out. But like, oh, it's so cool because we already know that the kitchen is where you know, Zool and Goza are, are stored in the uh, the fridge. Yeah. And so we know that the the, the kitchen's the scary point. And then, yeah, so seeing that glow of the door and the, the claws and then the claws through the couch. Screaming as the, as the chair goes. It, like, yep. Very cool. Yeah. Cuts to Lewis at his party and he suggests dancing to liven up the party. Did you notice this is a one take? Like, like, like his whole movement around the room, like from when he's first putting the, the, the food out on the table and he's talking about how he got like he writes it off as a tax write off and stuff. And then he moves around the room sees his blonde friend, tries to get her dancing. Then the doorbell rings and uh, what? Ted, it, Ted and Annette. Ted and Annette Fleming um, come in. Like it's all one take. And not, not only is it one take, he's improv all of it. So impressive. I love it so much. It, knowing uh, that Rick Moranis just delivered such beauty. Cause like you really watch it. Like it's, I want to use the word again, like a ballet watching the camera move mm. around this confined party space very impressive just the stuff that he says about like ted's carpet cleaning business and, <laughs> oh, it's it's so good so they're going into receivership yeah everybody this is ted and annette fleming how are you ted has a small carpet cleaning business in receivership and that's drawing a salary from a deferred bonus from two years ago the second attack this was probably the first time where i noticed the effects looking a bit janky there was something earlier where you see the street from like the perspective of the gargoyle just shot from the roof and so you're looking down at like the road of new okay, york okay yeah but the gargoyle hasn't really been put in probably so you can kind of see oh yeah, it. yeah 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 the, um, the, the, the layering sometimes does look a bit off yeah but certainly. i would say this is the first time where you go oh that's a bit yes agreed it's a bit like, funky yeah, looking the, like, the puppet work great correct so but when we first see the dog in the wardrobe mm -hmm. it's fine like when he throws the coats on it okay who brought the dog and then when it bursts out though then yeah the, the effects are dated quite a bit but it's still i i have fun yeah oh yeah. look it looks like a bit of a combination of things so as i said puppet work and stop motion but Later on, once it's on the street, it almost looks like hand-drawn animation. Yeah, there, there, there's a weird jumping thing where... And you can kind of see the, like, the square outline correct, of it. Correct, yeah. yeah. So th this actually speaks to the pressure that they were under, that there's a couple of effects. If they had had more time, they would have cleaned them up. Mm. But this one, 
there's something about the particular way they did the motion and then they have to reuse and reuse the generations of when they transfer it over yes. makes it look a bit funky. Yeah, um, it's, it's like in a remaster of something where it's quite dark in the background and you can't see anything and then they remaster it and it brightens the colours and now you can just see someone standing absolutely. in the back. But I, like when the dog has jumped out from the cupboard and then Lewis has run out to the hallway of like the 22nd floor where he lives mm -hmm. and then the dog jumps through the door again yeah. and then he goes to the elevator... His neighbor comes out and this is old woman. And like, that's one of my favorite things. She just like opens the door, looks out, she goes, Hoo! and then she closes the door again. It's the fun, like, it's not even a line. It's just a noise that she makes. <laughs> so funny. But yes, Lewis uh, tries to make an escape through Central Park, but he gets attacked at the restaurant. Everyone looks over. And then they all just turn back and keep having they're, they're their meal. At a, at a restaurant in Central Park. So they just think, oh, it's just like Central Park scum. Yeah. You know, we're just going to ignore it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I also thought it was cool afterwards. Obviously, all the cops are at the building when Venkman arrives for his date with Dana. And he's pretty unfazed by it all. Like he gets to her level, sees that the door's been broken on Lewis's apartment just kind of casually walks by. He's like, I'm still got a date to yeah, go to. Yeah, so he's like, got priorities. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then she opens the door. <laughs> One of my favorite lines when she says, are you the key master? And he goes, not that I know of. <laughs> Close the door. Are you the key master? <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and they do a really cool thing too. It's not just her costume, but they've done her makeup different to make her look more sinister. Yeah. And first time I ever noticed it watching it last night, at the end, after she breaks out of the statue, her makeup's been paired back again, so yes. she doesn't have that sinister kind of feel to it. I, I, part of the doco that I watched, she talks extensively about how well the makeup and wardrobe team did for that that transformation of, of being possessed. They really were considerate with like the hair, because mm. like, the hair becomes wilder, the, the look on her face um, in terms of the makeup, and then the flamey kind of orange dress like it was all very well considered um, and she was just really appreciative because she, like you said, she was already very excited about playing a role of being possessed mm -hmm. and then to have it kind of complemented by um, the look. It really makes the scene strong. Yeah. Now you said one of your favorite scenes between like the dynamic of them was earlier when he comes and plays the piano. This is by far my favorite scene between them. It's one of my favorite scenes. I guess it's between them, but it's more about... Oh, no, that's not true. I was going to say it's more about Dana's delivery, but Bill's responses oh, to... He, every one of his lines in this scene is hilarious. Do you want this body? Is this a trick question? I make a rule never to get involved with possessed people. Well, it's more of a guideline than a rule. And he's like, go on. No, I can't. Like, the internal yeah, struggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, I can't. Sounds like you got at least two people in there already. Might be a little crowded. The moral conflict he's facing. The effect of Dana levitating. That's cool. And like all done physically. Like, yeah, you so, know, yeah, so I, I've got theories like a pla like raised platform. That's why her dress kind of hangs down yep, to yep. hide the mechanism. That's how they did it. Yep. Yeah, very, very cool effect. And not just the voice that she uses, but her facial expression while she's talking in the voice is terrifying. The use of like the, the teeth, like the, the oh, gritting yeah. the teeth and yeah, like really impressive performance. She's got a theater background. Obviously she would- And what become... a lovely singing voice. <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, uh, but she also had already um, found fame with the first Alien film by yeah. now. But yeah, th this was a big role for her as well. Mm. Yep. Yeah, and she's great in it. I like that the demon dog that possesses Lewis is equally goofy as Lewis is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, like, we don't lose any of the, the goofball-y nature of his character once he's possessed. Like, Dane is someone completely different. He's still a bit Lewis-y. Yes, well, speaking to that, the puppeteer that plays the demon dog that Dana is possessed by mm -hmm. when it's just showing the dog was actually consciously like a female puppeteer because they wanted a bit more femininity and it still moves in a very scary monstrous way but mm. yeah it's it's got just a feminine element to it okay yeah, that's yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. so the cops end up bringing lewis to the ghostbusters picking up or dropping off yeah. <laughs> it just i feel like if you found someone who was acting that crazy 
you'd probably take him to the station or to get some help. But they, they've got a number of excuses as to why they brought him to the I was going to say, they, they le- legitimize why he's getting there. But he's sniffing the, the, the popcorn. So, uh, do you want some coffee? Do I? Yes, have some. Yes, yes have, have some. some. <laughs> I'm going to start saying that to you when we have a coffee. <laughs> yes, yes, have, have some. some. Peck comes back with a court order and sets all the ghosts free. I love this scene as well. The tension that uh, Peck brings in with bringing like the, the, the worker, the engineer guy and the cop as well mm. and like forcing himself onto them and they're like, trust us, yeah. this is a mistake and he's like such an arrogant ass. But even the cop who's there with Peck starting to have a disagreement with him just to remind everyone, yeah. no one likes this guy. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Rick Moranis's excitement during this scene. He's kind of like, he doesn't really know what's going on, but he's just having a ball so with good, it. So good, because he's still playing a possessed character, but still playing his geeky self. Yeah. Like even like when the, the firehouse kind of explodes in the roof and like all the smoke and is it coming out of it, you see him kind of run out slash kind of saunter out. It's yeah. really, it's so effective the way he plays that possessed character. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And then we get... A great montage, but accompanied with a haunting track. So Magic, the song Magic. So I was um, telling Mr. Brown before we started this podcast that when I got the soundtrack to this film on 12-inch vinyl, this was the song I wanted to find, but I couldn't find it. The actual part that we hear in the film doesn't start till halfway through the song. Mm. And so the, the song itself has this creepy turn where it then comes into this eerie kind of music. Magic, uh, magic. Oh. So good. Yes, yeah, very, very cool. So, and I like all the designs of the ghosts. Like, they're not all the same. And, like, it doesn't really explain why some ghosts look like people and some look like big balls of goo or uh, cabbies that are deteriorating. But it doesn't need to. Like, it's just a cool way of having, like, variety in the film. The the, the ghost that comes out of the subway is quite cool. Kind of the flying yes. pterodactyl looking thing. And that was thing. a puppet. Yeah, was, yeah. yeah. Um, but the the one that's the 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 cab driver, mm-hmm. that was one of the first scenes they shot. Yeah, so I like knowing that to see how assembly works as well. Yeah, where they kind of like we grab some great footage there, we'll put that in for that that scene there. Yeah, because they've set off a big sort of effectively an explosion uh, at the firehouse. The Ghostbusters all get arrested. Ray's just got blueprints with him. Yeah. They, they're in prison, but he's still got his massive blueprints. Yeah. Um, and they realize that uh, Dana's building is the gateway and that the end of the world is coming. And all the people in lock up with them all gather around and look at the plans as well. It's now, so great. This is the diehard tie-in. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you work out who the cop was that comes and tells him that the mayor wants to see them? It's Al from Die Hard. Welcome to the party, pal. Cool. Yeah, yeah. no, I missed that yeah. completely. Yeah. But we're introduced to the mayor. I love the mayor, Lenny. <sighs> so supposedly Bill Lenny. Murray, it, it was his idea that Lenny and the Pope were meant to be friends. So like... The, the, the Pope. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I was in hysterics when he just keeps looking over to the Pope for advice and he's just nodding yeah. along. <laughs> I think it's a sign from God. But don't quote me on that. Uh, but like the the dialogue in this scene is iconic in nature. There's some great lines. Obviously, the the whole wrath of God type stuff. Mm-hmm. Rivers and seas boiling, dogs and cats, cats living, living together. together. And then so uh, Winston's line of "I've seen shit that will turn you white." <laughs> like they 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 gave him a really good line there. But no line better than everything was fine until the power grid was shut off by Dickless. Here is that true? Yes, it's true. This man has no dick. <laughs> so, have you heard Paul, what happened to Paul William Atherton after this? Yeah, uh, the two a bus of people going past, throwing things at him and yelling at Dickless. Calling him Dickless just as he's walking down the street. Apparently, for quite a while, he was personally pissed off at Ivan Reitman for it. Yeah. Even though he plays a jerk in Die Hard, too. Mm. He's really good at playing a jerk, though. He's very impressive with it. The mayor agrees that they can... Give it a shot. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Everything's already turned to shit. Um, So they go to Dana's apartment and then we get the massive crowd cheering for them as they arrive. Oh, I love that the mayor's like, what do you need from me? And then it just instantly cuts to like all the army. Yeah. Venkman is probably the instigator of saying, give us this, give us that, give us that. The full like police escort down the, the main street. 
So good. The hard cut to them walking up the stairs after they've gone in, like you think, yeah, they're going in to fight. And then there's this scene, it, and it's like a matte painting of the stairs. Yeah. It just goes on forever. Yeah, we've got that vertigo look to it, and but also the music change as well. Um, yeah, I love it. Let me know when we get to 20. I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I thought there was a little bit of inconsistency in this part between once they start going to the roof, there's some inconsistency because the roof is always dark. Yeah. But there's times before everything goes dark in the city and like it cuts back to the ground of the city and everything's light still. Well, they because there's a cutaway scene back to like a, a shot of the building where the black is kind of spreading out from Yes, it. but then we get that shot where it like zooms out of the hole in Dana's apartment yeah, wall yeah. and everything's still light there, but it's it's shown that it's dark up Which, on the roof though. Like separately uh, to the continuity error of it all maybe, but like I love that. Oh, it's a look. great shot. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a great yeah, shot. Yeah. I do think like that, it's kind of inferred that that black that's coming out from the top of the building is slowly darkening the area. It doesn't pull me out of the film. And as no. we said, the, there was a very, very tight timeline for special effects and things like that. There's one coming up where they're like, yeah, it's a big error, but we just couldn't do anything I about know, it. I know the one you're referring to. Um, but yeah, so then we go to the roof and a post-coital Dana and Lewis turn back into dogs. I love that when they first have met the, oh, you're the key master, I'm the gatekeeper. Dana embraces Lewis and she takes the masculine pose of yep. kissing. It's so good. Yeah, uh, I love it. They head to the roof, they are possessed, they transform into dogs. Which makes you wonder why they needed to possess humans at all in the first place. There's that. but um, <laughs> They were the, already on the roof. They the could have just stayed there. The Ghostbusters get there just in time to see the transformation occur. Mm -hmm. And Venkman's line of, okay, she's a dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we are introduced to Goza, who was originally going to be played by Pee Wee Herman. Pee Wee Herman, and then um, who's the name of the female model that David Bowie dated for a while there? I can't remember. It's funny it. you say that because Goza kind of has a bit of a Bowie vibe. Yes, yeah, certainly got that androgyny kind yes. of going on for sure. Yep. Yeah, I, I like that kind of gender fluid feeling because it kind of suggests that Goza can be anything. Well, they're a god. Yeah, exactly. And, you know. <laughs> Ray, when someone asks if you're a god, you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so many good lines. Yeah. See, Winston still gets some good lines. Yep. They're talking about how they're a team. And then Bill Murray just goes, go get her, Ray. <laughs> they try and shoot at her with the proton packs directly. You go, aim for the flat top. <laughs> so good. And then they think they get her because she just disappears. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So they, they're, they're very self-congratulatory here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the they rum hear the voice yes, of the, the rumble and goes the voice. saying they must... Choose, choose the, the form, form of your destructor and of course ray thinks of the stay puffed marshmallow man it's amazing that they don't think of j edgar hoover because <laughs> bill murray clearly just said yeah, I know, I, I, that one always stuck out to me it's like bill murray is saying don't think of anything if you think of j edgar hoover then j edgar hoover will appear it's like how did In you order not to just say think it, of that you yeah. needed to think it yeah yeah, yeah. and then ray thinks of the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. Which I think, despite the fact that this is actually the sequence that has that glitchy error in the effects, I think the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man as a whole, best effect in the film. The close up behind the buildings as it goes through. It's, like, it's awesome as the final spectacle of the film. For, for sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. The special effects error is that on one of the wide shots, it's like when the Stay Puffed Marshmallow's foot comes down, you can see the building is like glitching next to itself. Oh, right. It just yeah. keeps like flickering oh, in and out. Oh, so that's not the error that I'm referring oh, to. Oh, which error okay. were you thinking um, of? I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here, but like when they're finally attacking Marshmallow Man from um, the top, mm -hmm. the particular shot that they used, he's not wearing his bow tie. They forgot to add that oh. back to the costume when they're constructing. They had three different suits that they used for all the, um, the stunt work for Marshmallow Man. Each suit cost them about $20,000 and all three suits got burnt up. They were very conscious of like, because different suits had different points where the puppeteer would enter them mm -hmm. because when they had shots at the back, they didn't want to see the zip there. So the zip's at the front for the other one. Mm -hmm. They forgot to put these red bow tie on. That's interesting. Um, so if you watch back, yeah, he's missing the bow tie just in that one shot. He's a sailor. He's in New York. We get this guy <laughs> laid. We won't have any problem. <laughs> so good. <laughs>
This is when they realize they can cross the streams yes. to close the gateway. See you on the other side, Ray. Nice working with you, Dr. Venkman. <laughs> You'll have to remember it, because I'm, I'm planning on closing the podcast with it. So. <laughs> Even though it makes no sense for Walter Peck to be here at all in this sequence, they just bring him to the bottom of the building so that they can dump marshmallow goo on him. Yeah, so um, when Atherton got told that this was going to happen, he goes, how much shaving cream are you going to be dumping? And they said, oh, about 75 pounds. Mm. And he's like, that sounds pretty heavy. And they're like, oh, but it's shaving cream. And he, he remembered back to high school that the whole 75 pounds of feathers is the same as 75 pounds of cement. Yeah. So they brought in a stuntman to test it and found Flattened out that it, yeah, yeah, it really yeah. knocked him out. So they reeled back how much shaving cream they were going to dump on him. I like that anecdote. Great gag that all of the Ghostbusters are covered in marshmallow from head to toe. Except Venkman. Yes. Venkman's got like this tiny little bit in his yeah, hair and that's it. He's been able to stay clean, stay out of trouble in that regard for sure. Dana and Lewis are alive. <laughs> Go help the little guy. <laughs> the real heartfelt moment when they're, they're worried that these two have died in the mm -hmm. in the action. It smells like barbecued hair, I think, is what like, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As they're pulling Lewis out, they're talking about all the experiments and things that they're going to do on him, and he's just so accepting of it. You have been a participant in the biggest interdimensional cross rip since the Tunguska Blast of 1909. Felt great. We'd like to get a sample of your brain tissue. Okay. He goes, who does your taxes? <laughs> <laughs> And he's just gone through all of this and he wants to know if he can get a tax off from them. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, they talk about like dissecting him. It's like, oh, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, you would have been happy. Obviously, it's a very, very quick wrap up at the end of the film. It's a nice like montage too. Like you get the triumphant music, but you see all of the characters one last time. The fact that they all get in the car together and Lewis goes in the ambulance but he's like he's, he goes, he's I want to go with them yeah, yeah, go with yeah, yeah. He, goes, he says that I want to go with them yeah, uh, yeah. It's, that's pretty much all I had it's a it's a classic I know you want to talk about it much longer oh no, we, we covered it pretty well like it's just such a great ride of a film I, I said to you before we did the podcast I could probably not watch this film and still be able to talk about it quite adequately but, but you're always looking for excuses to watch it I watch it probably yearly at this stage now like but when I was a kid it used to be weekly like mm. I've seen this film so many times well yeah maybe we'll get to talk about Ghostbusters 2 Electric Boogaloo if it gets suggested <laughs> for a future week but I, I would be interested to know more modern audiences younger audiences whether they can just see the brilliance of this film like it mm. is such a objectively strong film in its comedic elements its narrative structure its use of special effects awesome awesome flick Alrighty. well with that let us move on to our weekly watches weekly 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 watches weekly 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 watches at I got two movies which were both pretty lackluster. Well, I had a pretty quiet week as well. I've only got three movies. Okay. Um, varying levels of quality for the three. Mm, and look, I've got a TV show which I've seen many times before, and I saw a, a live musical. Oh, well. Ah, well, I've got something a bit left of center as well. I have a video game to talk about. Ah, cool. Mm. I'm going to kick things off with Vivarium. Mm. One that. When I first saw it advertised, I was actually pretty interested in it. Like, it looks like a psychological thriller. Well, it was a psychological thriller, but I wasn't thrilled by it. Mm. Um, so it's got Jesse Eisenberg. Imogen I, Poots. Imogen Poots, that's correct, yes. I like both of them mm. a lot. Um, and I like psychological thrillers. They can be hit and miss. Uh, this one was a big old miss for me. So it's about a couple who are looking for a house and when they get shown to a brand new uh, suburbia style um, housing development where all the houses look identical as they're being shown that the person who is showing them around disappears on them and then they're kind of trapped there they, they spend a little bit of time focused on the escape at the start but it's more about the deterioration of their mental state and it's a i guess it's a comment on feeling suffocated by that suburbia lifestyle like people think that it's what they want and then when they're in it, they, they don't want it anymore. And there's, there's other elements to it, but I don't want to give anything away. 
just in case, despite my very negative review of it, people who weren't on board. It was just, it was a little too weird for me. Yeah. I didn't really connect with the message of the film. You don't necessarily mind weird. I don't though. mind weird, but I like the metaphor of weird when I care about what the metaphor is saying. Yes. Whereas I didn't for yeah. this, so I was just waiting for it to play out. And it's just, yeah, it's really weird. And for some of it, I'm like, why? Why have you done this? So... Yeah, that was just a big old miss for me. And that was Friday night where I was very geared up to watch a good film. So a very disappointing Friday with that one followed by my next one. Well, the night before, I think um, I had a bit of a slog at, the, at school on the day. And I just wanted to go home and watch something that was a bit like simple, easy going, easy to digest film. Uh, so I went scrolling through the streaming services and I came across... Um, the 1986 film? You may be able to correct me. Oh, the 1986 Yeah, yeah, there's film. only one yeah. in that whole year. No, um, uh, Roxanne, starring Steve Martin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, like a romantic comedy starring Steve Martin, who we all know as just one of the greatest comedians uh, of the modern era. Unbelievably um, good. Uh, Mr. Brown, you're a particularly huge fan of Martin. I am, though I did, when you said you were watching Roxanne, um, even though I've seen it a few times before, it's one of the few films that he's made that I don't own. Right. Um, so it's actually been, yeah, quite quite a while since I've seen it. Yeah, um, so it's uh, co-starring Daryl Hannah, and then there's a few other fa familiar of faces. Of Splash fame. Yes, of Splash also, um, someone who went for the role of Dana in uh, Ghostbusters. Is that yeah, right? There's an early casting video where Daryl Hannah went for it. Also starring Shelley Duvall um, mm -hmm. uh, of The Shining. But yeah, uh, it was fun. It was light. It was easy. It's nothing really spectacular. And the comedy in it is so-so. But it's exactly what I wanted it to be. Oh, it's super silly. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like the man with two brains style, Steve Martin. But like, I think there's... Some of his comedy is a bit more, not edgy, but like more engaging. Whereas this one was pretty light on with mm -hmm. like the, the how much humor was really um, through it. It was more leaning into the romance of everything. Yeah, right. was, I still enjoyed it though. It's exactly what I wanted it to be. So that's Roxanne. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, my second disappointing film was Smile, which as far as I knew, had received really positive reviews. Maybe, Funny, maybe I'm wrong. Because just as a side note, because I'm looking at this upside down, I thought the film was called Slime. I'm like, oh, it's maybe a Ghostbusters reference. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, not quite. I wish I'd just watched Ghostbusters again. Yeah. Uh, so Smile was originally uh, a short film. I quite liked the short film. But this one I didn't really engage with at all. Like, the characters make weird choices in it. The plot doesn't really go anywhere. Like, you don't feel any sense of resolution at the end of the film. The types of scares in it, they're all really cheap jump scare kind of right. effects. And it just, it's relentless. Yeah. You never get to just sit and enjoy the movie. It's just like jump scare after jump scare after jump scare. And yeah, I just didn't really care about the characters either. Like, they didn't give you enough of the characters outside of the scary plot that made you go, if something bad happened to this character, I'll be devastated. So if anything did happen to a character that was bad, you go, oh, well, yeah, just I didn't connect with it at all. But I, I think it's getting or well, I think it got relatively positive reviews. Maybe, well, maybe I'm wrong. It got lumped in with all like the, the new age horror that's coming out in the last few years. Like you and I are both big fans of Barbarian, mm -hmm. which um, was a, a bit of a revelation in recent horror. Um, and then obviously we've talked about Talk to Me. Um, mm -hmm. and how great that is. And then there's a new film coming out called It Lives, it Lives Inside. Is that what it's called? Uh, yes, we yeah. spoke about that last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we yeah. spoken about it before. Uh, it comes out in a few weeks, and I'm quite excited to see it. So, yeah, this film got marketed into that new kind of horror, but I hadn't seen it as yet, and so it sounds like I'm not missing too much. You're not missing anything. Right, is it that... I, I would never week. watch this again. Okay. And you know that I'm more likely to... When you say you'll never watch it again, you can sometimes even enjoy films and go, but I don't need to see it ever again. Correct. Whereas for me, like, even films I'm so-so on, more often than not, I, I return to them because yep. I, I kind of like analysing things yeah, and, sure. and going back. But, yeah, this I have no desire to oh, see. Oh, that's a shame. Two for two in terms of... Uh, Both sales. on the same night. And yeah. my, oh, my Friday right. night, I, uh, that's my... my 
prime movie watching night? Well, my next one was a bit of a fail for me as well. Not a fail because I'd actually already seen it, but I'm a massive, massive fan of um, Joel and Ethan Cohen films. We're mm-hmm. talking Fargo. We're talking Big Lebowski. We're talking Burn Serious after Man. Reading. Burn After Reading. And then there's like a little film called No Country for Old Men. Which, I believe I've heard of yeah, it. Yeah, I may have spoken about it. May, not my favorite film of all time, but if someone asks me, the question what I think is the best film of all time, I'll say that film. Two different questions. Did I tell you, because you know that I'm not a big No Country for Old Men yeah. fan. Yeah. Did I tell you that I really want to return to it because I'd watch like an, an analytical video on it? Of the sunset, the sunrise scene? There's, uh, a, there's a particular scene. No, where, um, more about well, uh, visual storytelling and like okay. him cleaning his boots and things oh, like that. Oh, yes. I, I recently watched, I think, the same little uh, video yeah. on YouTube. Yeah, and so I, yeah. Really, I really want to return to it now yeah. because... I feel like perhaps I watched it. Maybe I was a little naive and didn't connect with it. But yeah, I, I'm interested to. I'd be interested to, it. to hear your comments on the rewatch. But um, I just a, a completist in terms of the Coen Brothers, and I've seen all their films. But there was a couple that I don't really remember, and there's a reason why because they have got a few flops. One of them being Intolerable Cruelty. I don't even know that one. George Clooney mm-hmm. and Catherine Zeta-Jones. It's like a... George Clooney's been in a few. He was yeah, uh, yeah, old brother where Rob Yeah, Bell he's or... partnered up with them a few times. Um, but the sequence was Fargo, Big Lebowski, Oh Brother, We're Out There. Hit after hit. Mm-hmm. And then they went with Intolerable Cruelty, yep. which was really... It's a piss weak film. You'd say it was intolerable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a reason why it was not memorable for me because it's just not a good film. Um, and then the one afterwards, which actually on Letterboxd has the lowest um, ranking of all of their films, and they've released, I think, 19 now, okay. um, is The Lady Killers, which is a remake of an old film starring Tom Hanks. Do you ever see that one? Uh, I think I did a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, I saw it when it came out. Same as Intolerable Cruelty, but I couldn't remember either of them. So I, I will get to The Lady Killers in the upcoming weeks. But yeah, Intolerable Cruelty, one of the Coen brothers' weakest films. My TV show, Disenchantment. So animated, like a Matt Groening show. Oh, yeah. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Like, I, I love The Simpsons. I love Futurama. So when this came out, naturally, I was pretty excited Are for it. Are they going for the same kind of humor? Is like Same kind of humor, but it's set in, like, medieval times. Yeah, so there's, I, there's a whole new kind of humor that you can gauge just from the different time period. I've got it pending as, a, like, a watch to get to, but I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, it, yeah. I... I I think you'd enjoy it. Yeah, cool. Um, even though it is a cartoon. Yes, so. but like, you know, like you, I love The Simpsons. Futurama I got into a little bit, but not as much as some others, but yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I really like it. And it does have like mythological creatures in it as well. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> but uh, I think the humor kind of outweighs sure. that. Sure, yep. Yeah, so I, I'd seen Disenchantment many times before. Um, I think a new season actually came out, so I went back to the start, and so I'm I'm back watching season one again. Now. Oh, cool! Mm-hmm. That one's on Netflix, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Final film that I watched over the week was a film called Mass. Uh, this film came out about two years ago. Directorial debut for a guy who, like, I don't really, I don't even remember his name. Um, can't give him the credit, but he's an actor. Like, a, he plays like bit roles in a bunch of other films, but he directed this film, wrote and directed this film called Mass. And it takes place, like, there's a few scenes at the start and scenes at the end that are setting up what's happened or happening, but 80 minutes of it is in this one room. Right. Uh, So it's all about the conversation that these two couples have within the room. Now, I don't want to give too much away, but these two couples come together after a very tragic event has happened. These films run a risk, right? Because they're so grounded in the narrative and also the delivery. But when your actors are strong and the film story is strong, it wins. And this one was an absolute winner for me. Like, Ah, so this is out of the three I watched this week. I'm like, awesome. There's films that have worked like this before. Like, have you ever seen Carnage? And then we've talked about Alfred Hitchcock before and Rope. You know how yes. Rope is like set in all of that one scene uh, setting, um, similar to that, right? Yeah. So oh well, in TV they call it a bottle episode. I don't know if they they have a similar name for it in film. Oh, so where it's all within the one scene? Yeah, like yeah, Seinfeld, right. the Chinese food restaurant. Ah, right. I hadn't heard that term. There you go. Yep. So here I was thinking I wouldn't get a Seinfeld reference in this one. She called. He yelled Cartwright. <laughs> I missed them. Who's Cartwright? I'm Cartwright. <laughs> You're not Cartwright. Of course I'm not Cartwright! 
Nice. Um, so that's Mass from, I think it was about two years ago. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, mate, I'll have to check it out. Last one for me. So I went and saw Moulin Rouge and it was actually a rewatch. I'd seen it live before, like big fan of the movie, saw it live uh, about a year ago. Maybe it was more than a year ago. It was delayed because of COVID stuff. And so the run ended up having to go over to Sydney and it's now come back to Melbourne. So they would have had to pack up the really extravagant sets, would have had to pack all of that up and travel with it and come back. Same cast as I saw it with. The reason I re-watched it, I went with my sisters the first time and we bought tickets for mum because she always felt really bad that she'd missed out because we talked about how great it was. So we bought tickets for mum and Maddie went along as well. Sure. And it, it was like one of my favorite shows that I'd ever seen. So I was super excited. And look, I will say this, I didn't enjoy it nearly as much the second time. I guess part of that comes down to it's not as much of a spectacle, there's no surprises in it. But also, I could tell that it felt a little tired when you've Ah, been doing a show for so long. And in particular, and I I feel terrible saying this, but in particular, um, the woman who was playing Satine, you could tell that she was really under the weather, like her voice was very, very strained. Like... Still incredible, all things considered, but because I had heard her the first time and she blew me away, there was a, a real difference between the two performances. Were you reluctant to share that that view on it, though, with your family members and Maddie because you didn't want to spoil their experience it, of it? Especially the ones that yeah. hadn't seen it, but yeah. Maddie's always like pretty critical with yeah. stuff when she sees them anyway. And so once everyone was already talking about it, I was like, oh, well, might, yeah. might as well talk <laughs> yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. Still amazing, but yeah, I walked away from it the first time going, that might be the best live show I've ever seen. And yesterday I was like, oh, maybe not, maybe not. (laughs) So Still enjoyable though. Still very enjoyable. It was a a great, great day. Cool. Uh, Last one for me, I went around to my friend's house on Saturday night, had some dinner with them, and then they said it's EA Sports sale day, so they were able to buy games for the Nintendo Switch that are normally like 60, 70 bucks for 10 bucks. They had bought... Monopoly on the Nintendo Switch. I love Monopoly. I'll play along. This game, like, obviously... It's How does it differ from just playing the board game Monopoly? N- not so, not a great deal in terms of the rules. You still follow it, but the animation and the interaction with it is really fun. Like, so okay. you, you have to shake the controller and then throw the dice still. Right. Um, and then, uh, obviously, all the strategy that comes into Monopoly as well. But it also was a lot of fun in terms of what's on the screen and the music. And it was just a blast. We played a three-hour game of Monopoly on the Nintendo Switch. Even, like, from Monopoly, that's a quick game. I'd forgotten that the game can go that long. And then my friend Susie, she'd never played Monopoly before. She picked it up pretty quick. She's a clever, clever individual. But I had not told her that it could potentially be a long game. I, I vaguely remember it being a long game, but I wouldn't have played Monopoly 15, 20 years. Yeah, right. Um, so, yeah, had a blast. Oh, Very awesome. tired afterwards. Yeah. So, yeah, Monopoly on the, the Nintendo Switch. Good fun. Nice one. I guess we will move on to tantalizing trailers. Tantalizing films. Trailers. Don't know if we will be a fan. How will it be? We'll know in time. Top of my list, the Royal. Hotel. So I sent this one to you. Oh, you yes, this I watched this one. This should be on my list because I did also watch the trailer for it, but you can talk about it. Uh, so an Australian film, but actually with two Americans in the leading role. So Jessica Henwick from Glass Onion and Julia Garner from Ozark. So I, I like both of them a lot. I, I actually haven't seen Jessica Henwick in a serious role. Like obviously Glass Onion's a bit over the top and exaggerated. I really like both of them from what I've seen. Uh, But basically, they are two U.S. backpackers who take a job in a pub in a remote Australian town, and things turn sinister. Um, I sent you a message as soon as I watched it. I said I was getting real Waking Fright vibes, which if you haven't seen Waking Fright, it's a bit of a tricky watch. I found it particularly hard to watch because it it is a psychological thriller. It's about, um, similar to this, it's about someone who gets stuck in an Australian town over, he's a teacher, he's a British teacher, and he gets stuck in the Australian town over his holiday break, kind of descends into madness because of uh, the circumstances that surround him. But I wouldn't say anything too sinister happens to him. It's just he sort of gets 
maybe it's a cultural shock for him yeah. um and yeah he goes down like a really dark path and it feels somewhat similar to that i would say that it definitely looks like more sinister things are going to be happening the girls are certainly in a very vulnerable state because they're surrounded by these really aggressive male characters my in the film. understanding of the film it's directed by an australian director called kitty green who worked with um julia garner on a film called the assistant which was um uh, the Weinstein uh, kind of representation oh, okay, film, right. uh, which kind of came under a lot of controversy. I really enjoyed that. So I'm, this will be her second feature length film and um, Hugo Weaving's in there mm -hmm. as like Mr. Kind of the, Anderson, the, 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 the gruff kind of bartender. But then, like you said, in the trailer, you see all these other men that they interact with. And my understanding is that the film's going to be talking a lot about the power struggles that um, the women face. Definitely that seems of, that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very keen to see it as well. Looks great it looks great yeah suspenseful yeah I'm, I'm keen for the royal hotel um and even though it's an australian film it doesn't like it has more of that uh, american kind of quality to the way that it's been shot yeah like if we compare it to what was the australian one we were just talking about beaten to death beaten to death yeah, yeah. if you compare it to that that has a real australian feel to Correct. the way it's shot yes so yeah it's interesting like i i, I think it looks like it's going to be well made and great performances so yep, yeah it should sure. be good Trailer-wise, for me, first one I watched was animated feature from uh, the Aardman Studios, uh, Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget. They're doing a second oh, Chicken Run. I've yeah. seen this one too. Yeah, this yeah. should be on my <laughs> list. Yeah. I'm excited. I am too. I, I love the first Chicken Run. I love pretty much anything these guys do in uh, the Aardman Studios. I, I don't want to be a par. <laughs> I don't like craving. Dawn of the Nugget. I, I like... The trailer just kind of had a lot of action sequences in it and the excitement and funny. And yeah, return the, of all your favorite characters. Yes. Um, so I'm going to have to return to the original because the original came out in the year 2000. I've watched that a lot. See, I've, I would have seen it maybe twice and loved it, but like moved on from it. Like, whereas like, yeah, this is going to be a sequel to the first with a return of characters. I'll have to check out the first one well, again. The reason I love the first one so much is because I love The Great Escape. And clearly the first one is supposed to be a... a giant kind of like spoof of the great escape um which by the way ethan watched it on the weekend oh right yeah. yes yeah um so that's chicken run dawn of the nugget excited for that one i've only got one more it's called pain hustlers and it was just a teaser trailer so chris evans and emily blunt i really like them both uh looks like it's a crime drama about them sort of drug peddling borderline is it legal is it not legal like based on what the trailer has shown it seems like i i think even chris evans has a line in the trailer where he's like oh it's like going 70 in a 50 zone they are doing something that's not quite on the level but um they're not like big crime lords but maybe it'll descend into that so it was just a teaser it didn't give a whole lot of information away but I really like the two of those actors and I think they'll have like a good chemistry. Well, hopefully Chris Evans is making reparations for that shocking film that I didn't even see the one he did with Anna de Armas earlier this year. You, you watched ghosted? it. I yeah, didn't, ghosted? I didn't watch it. I no. thought you watched it. Nah, uh, I, I reckon I saw someone a trailer for it. Someone I spoke to watched it and said it was as bad as you'd think it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't yeah. look great. No, yeah. So hopefully he's making up for that. I've got two more. Another animated feature for me, Studio Ghibli. Uh, I don't know if you've seen much of like, you know, you I've seen Spirited, Spirited Away, Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, uh, Grave of the Fireflies. They, these guys are known as just being prolific with um, delivering some great animated features. And they haven't done one for a while, but they've got a return to form coming with The Boy and the Heron. Doesn't give too much away in the trailer, just shows a lot of magical mystery kind of stuff going on. Very much what you'd expect from the Studio Ghibli guys, but... I am excited for it. I've never gotten to see one of their films on the big screen, so I'll make the effort to go see this when it does come out. It's already, it's got like a weird release thing going on where it's already been released in Japan because that's where it originated from. So it's going to have like a slow worldwide release. That's not that uncommon. I know we got Talk To Me earlier than America did. Yeah, so I, I think there's a regional thing that comes into play with it as well. Mm. So that's The Boy and the Heron. The final one for me was I like the only reason I pressed play on it when it came up in the YouTube algorithm was because Tom Hardy 
was um, shown in it. Okay. It's called The Bike Riders. Right. Uh, and the title alone, I'm like, oh. And then, yeah, I'm like, but I'm a big fan of Tom Hardy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I press play on it. And it's got um the guy who played Elvis, Austin Butler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Is he still talking in the Elvis voice? Because I heard uh, it was pretty hard to maybe. shake. Maybe. Anyway, this film's about like a bike gang in the 60s. And I'm like, I struggled to even sit through the trailers. And when I got halfway through, I'm like, this film will not be played on my TV. Yeah, it, yeah. it came up in my like recommended videos. And I was like, algorithm, you have stuffed up there. I just don't understand. Like Tom Hardy should be signing up to only hits by now. Like surely he has the kind of... The... But maybe he likes this story though. Maybe, I don't know. Like, but his back catalogue is 50-50 in terms of there's some real stinkers in mm. his back catalogue. That's true. Mm. That's uh, the bike riders. So don't check that out. All right, <laughs> if you insist. <laughs> on that a positive note. Uh, yeah, well, we are, we are wrapped on a very long final podcast of the term. We haven't even mentioned that this is our, our final for the term. So we'll be taking a hiatus for the next two, three weeks. We will press pause on the podcasting for a couple of weeks. Uh, we do have a particular film already lined up for our return. Is that week one back? Week one back. Righto. Yes. Well, boy, am I excited. <laughs> Uh, uh, as always, guys, we do uh, really appreciate it if you can like, subscribe, comment, share it around. Uh, anything you want to say to the folks before we, we exit? See you on the other side, Mr. Brown. Nice working with you, Dr. Whittle. I was so prepared to say Dr. Venkman. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Bye.